From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. With Anne-Marie Hordern in New York, I'm Joe Matthew in Washington. Another day, another Republican presidential hopeful officially entering the race for 2024. Too much is given, much will be required. That's why today, before God and my family, I'm announcing that I'm running for president of the United States of America. And North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum also making his official announcement today. We'll break it all down with our political panel next. Plus another showdown in the U.S. House, this time between members of the same party as Republican hardliners bring business to a halt in a show of force against Speaker Kevin McCarthy. We'll have more on that ahead. But Anne-Marie, you're joining us from smoky New York today. I wasn't sure if you were going to have a mask on. You doing all right? Yeah, we are. But to be honest, uh, when you go outside, you really can feel it. And these pictures, I think, do 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 exactly do it justice. You actually feel this uh, on you. Yeah, it, it's a pretty dense uh, feeling. You do feel this in some cities as well. Uh, lots of reporting about this, obviously, in places like Beijing and Shanghai, in India. Right. But, Joe, you know what the meteorologists are saying? This is coming your way potentially this overnight. So prepare for this tomorrow morning. And you thought the smoky back rooms were the only thing going on here in Washington. It looks like Blade Runner in <laughs> lower Manhattan today. Uh, but, Anne-Marie, we've got 2024 in full swing here. Another major announcement. Well, two, in fact, as you just mentioned, and joining us now, Bloomberg's Washington bureau chief Peggy Collins at the table, as well as national security reporter Dan Flatley. Peggy, it's great to have you with us here as we all kind of swerve from the debt ceiling saga to 2024. And it really does feel like it's underway in earnest. Chris Christie uh, with the town hall last night. Mike Pence out with a, a shiny ad this morning that really evokes the whole uh, city on a hill, the, the Reagan-esque view of America. He even mentions the words city on a hill. Is there a lane for a Republican like that in this Republican Party? Well, I think there's two main lanes really shaping up as the Republican field fills out with lots of candidates. I think we're up to around 10 at this point. And the two main lanes are kind of, are you in the lane with Trump and trying to say like DeSantis, hey, I'm the future of the Republican Party that was under Trump? Or are you in the lane that's running against Trump? You know, we saw some really strong words come out of the former vice president, president, vice uh, President Pence's um, dialogue today, kind of trying to really distinguish himself and say he never wants to see, you know, President Trump in the White House again. And then you're also seeing people on, uh, like Chris Christie, Governor Chris Christie, also say similar things like that, really trying to distinguish themselves from him. Yeah, yeah when you look at the former vice president, what he was really trying to also establish is not a connection to his former boss. He said he was the former vice president, but didn't show any pictures of who his boss was. Take a listen and a look at exactly what he said this morning as he announced. I know we can bring this country back. We can defend our nation and secure our border. We can revive our economy and put our nation back on a path to a balanced federal budget. We can defend our liberties and give America a new beginning for life. But it'll require new leadership in the White House and the Republican Party. Dan, is there a lane for this type of candidate? Obviously, he's going to go heavy on the evangelicals and try to get their support. Yeah, I think that, you know, there is certainly a lane for Pence. I think it depends on how far he gets in that lane. Um, you know, there's, uh, as Peggy was saying earlier, you know, there's a number of uh, candidates in the race now. Um, but the big, uh, the, the big challenge right now, of course, is, is from President Trump, uh, former President Trump, I should say. And, and he is, uh, at, at this moment, still a front runner. I think that the problem that a candidate like Pence uh, or, or some of these others may run into as they get further down the line is how are they going to play uh, with a general uh, electorate? if they make it that far. And, of course, the, you know, that's a very open question. But if you tack to the right of Trump on some of these issues, that makes it all the more difficult to get to the left 
uh, if you need to in a general election. So I think that's going to be the big question for somebody like Pence. Mm -hmm. For somebody like Chris Christie, it's a little bit different. You know, he was the governor of a big northeastern state. He has a little bit of a different tack that he can take that may make him a little bit more of a viable candidate in the general election. But his mission seems to be, I'm here to take out Trump, basically. Yeah. I did it with Marco Rubio, and, and we saw uh, Senator Rubio push back against that a little bit on Twitter yesterday. But he's like, I'm on a kamikaze mission to take out, uh, to take out Trump. Well, he even went so far as to address that last evening to say, I'm not on a kamikaze, I want to win this thing and be the next president. But interesting, the contrast between uh, these two. We've been talking about a potential lane for Mike Pence, and he's taking his own approach to this, telling people that, by the way, if you heard him speak today in Iowa, he said that Donald Trump nor Joe Biden are capable of bringing the country uh, together again. Uh, Chris Christie just went for the jugular in a town hall in Manchester last night to prove his bona fides. Listen. The grift from this family is breathtaking. It's breathtaking. Jared Kushner and Ivanka Kushner walk out of the White House and months later get $2 billion from the Saudis. $2 billion from the Saudis. You think it's because he's some kind of investing genius? So the idea here is this is the one man who can go after Donald Trump on stage. He was actually physically trying to prove that last night, leaning into people who were asking him questions and some pretty serious charges about the Trump family. Well, I think, you know, Governor Chris Christie, being from New Jersey myself, oh, I know nice. he doesn't pull any punches. <laughs> but I will say the question to Dan's great point earlier is, like, where does this really p play with the base? Mm -hmm. Because it's about the primary first before we get to the general election. So is Governor Chris Christie's comments going to resonate with the base that is really fired up about potentially seeing Trump again in the White House? Or will it resonate with people who might be thinking more about we don't want to go back to some of the things we saw then? Or what's yeah. happening in the economy? Where is inflation? Where are our geopolitics? So I think we have a ways to go, but certainly everyone is talking about former President Trump, and he is one of the central pieces of which lane you pick and how you go about trying to win any type of votes right now. The other big question, of course, is who is going to win the Wall Street vote? And there's a Bloomberg Invest conference taking place right now at the Bloomberg headquarters in New York, and obviously everyone is talking about on the sidelines or they're on record who potentially they like, who would they like to see getting in the race. Here is who billionaire investor Stanley Druckenmiller is excited about. I'm kind of excited about Chris Christie taking on Donald Trump. The others kind of like dance around the subject. They don't even use his name. I think somebody needs to hit him in the mouth with the way he hits people in the mouth. And Chris Christie could be very good at that. Dan, though, to your point, Chris Christie, is he there just to serve a purpose? Will these Republican candidates that do not want to see the former president get the nomination, will they have the reality check potentially they need to say, I'm ready to exit and I will coalesce behind whoever is second winning in the polls at that time? Well, I think, uh, you know, Trump went through two impeachment trials in the Senate during his time in office. And one of the things that you sort of heard in the halls of Congress from members who were willing to talk about it was the next time Trump runs for office, somebody needs to take him on and take him on directly. You know, this was sort of part of the soul searching in the, in the Republican Party that came after the 2016 election and everything that happened, obviously, uh, in the 2020 election and, and on January 6th was, do we really need to take him on directly? And you see Chris Christie sort of doing that. So this is a test of that theory, basically, which has been debated, you know, in back rooms here in D.C. and among some more moderate members of the Republican Party for years now, is can you take on Trump head on and win? And people have tried it before to a certain extent. What we see Christie doing now is really putting a finer point on that and it's still kind of an open question as to whether this will kill Trump or only make him stronger as a candidate. Questions about when we might hear uh, about a potential indictment here. The president, the former president, is actually truthing about it, if I can use that 
as a verb the way he does here. He says he's not been told he will be indicted in a federal case, which is making it uh, it's interesting why he would go to the trouble of actually writing this on Truth Social. But indeed, no one has told me I'm being indicted, and I shouldn't be because I've done nothing wrong. He writes, but I have assumed for years that I am a target of the weaponized DOJ and FBI, starting with the Russia hoax, and he goes on from there. Uh, Peggy, uh, if and when this indictment arrives, this would be the Mar-a-Lago documents case that at least has been anticipated here in Washington. Will it make a difference? Well, I think it's a good reminder for all of us. We have a long way to go to November 2024 and even to the primaries early next year, even though we're really starting to prepare. Mm -hmm. And I think we don't know what's going to happen, what things are going to come up that may influence voters in a big way. I think in terms of the cases, we should also remember that it's not just one that's floating out there for former President Trump, but more than one. So I think it's a question that remains to be seen about how much voters will take those results into consideration. Yeah, of course, when that breaks, we'll tell you about it. Uh, but when the president, the former president starts talking about it, you wonder. He tends to be the one who leaks that this might be about to happen. <laughs> uh, great conversation uh, with Anne Marie in New York. I'm Joe Matthew. Our thanks to Bloomberg's Washington Bureau Chief Peggy Collins and National Security Reporter Dan Flatley. Coming up, Florida Senator Rick Scott joins us. We'll get his thoughts on the 24 election cycle and the direction of the Republican Party next. On Balance of Power, this is Bloomberg. Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. Thanks for joining us. The 2024 race heating up with Florida in the spotlight as Ron DeSantis and Donald Trump could, of course, be bringing their fight to the presidency here to the Sunshine State. And here now to offer his thoughts on that and a range of issues. Florida Senator Rick Scott, it's great to see you, Senator. Thanks for joining us today from Capitol Hill. Before I get into the race, I have to ask you what's happening uh, right there in Congress today, where we've got a bit of a revolt, as it's being reported by some members of the Freedom Caucus and the U.S. House, who have brought their discouragement, their frustration over the debt ceiling deal uh, to the matter at hand here, and in fact, stopping business for a second day from uh, taking place in the U.S. House. I know you're a senator, but as you peer over from the other chamber, is the U.S. Congress at a point of dysfunction? Well, first off, I don't think most Americans are sitting here saying, gosh, I need another law uh, passed that's going to impact how I lead my life. So I don't think most Americans are anxious about another law being passed or another spending bill being passed. So I think, I think what we've got to do is, is, you know, everybody has the opportunity to represent their district or their state and be very vocal yeah. about what they want to accomplish. Uh, and that's, what, that's what's going on up here. That's what, we ought, that's what we were set up. That's how the Constitution was set up. Everybody ought to, I represent Florida. I tell people, I'm not going to tell you how to vote. I'm going to tell you why I'm doing, I'll tell you why I'm representing my state. And that's what everybody ought to do. Well, one tussle of, of the latest seems to be about, as well, Ukraine funding. This is how some defense hawks in the Senate were able to vote for the debt ceiling bill. And now Speaker McCarthy is saying uh, he doesn't look like he's going to want to entertain a supplemental. If there was put before you legislation about more aid to Ukraine, is that something you'd be willing to support? Well, first off, I didn't support the debt ceiling bill because I don't think it solved the problems of this country. Um, you know, inflation is the biggest issue we have. It did nothing to reduce inflation. Matter of fact, it's going to make it worse. It did nothing to make people feel more comfortable about their retirement or their, their medical bills. So I think it, I, don't, I don't think it was a, a great bill for the American public. Uh, more Democrats and Republicans voted for it. Uh, and I think the public lost. With regard to Ukraine, I think we've, we've got to address how do we make sure uh, we do everything we can to help Ukraine win, but we also have to make sure... Uh, that we're not wasting dollars. We're going to have $35 trillion worth of debt uh, in two years, $35 trillion. Uh, and we've got to make sure that, you know, this is in Europe. Uh, so, uh, and so it's, it's, we've got to make sure Germany and France do more than their fair share. Uh, can't just be the American taxpayer that's paying for this. So I want, I want uh, Ukrainians to win. I want to be supportive. I want Russia to lose. Uh, because it's wrong what they did, but we have $35 trillion of debt. Let's look at lethal aid that's going to help them Ukraine win, not just have another prolonged war that goes on forever and ever. 
Senator, you, of course, were chair of the National Republican Senatorial Committee. You were in charge of getting Republicans reelected, so you're pretty close to the campaign trail here in your own mind, I'm sure, in your soul, as you're also uh, running for reelection yourself. Uh, there was a lot of talk, as you well remember, uh, involving uh, candidate quality, as we heard from Mitch McConnell at the time during the midterm elections. I wonder how you would rate the quality of the Republican candidates who are now crowding the stage. Oh, we've got great people running. And you know, this is what's great about this country. You believe, if you want to run for president or the Senate or Congress, say, go out there and express your views and, you know, get in there and, and tell people what you're going to do and then let the voters decide what they want. This, these elections ultimately come down to who, do you, who does the American public believe has the best ideas and has the ability to implement those ideas. When I ran in 2010, I, ran, I was not the establishment Republican. I ran in a primary, and they, they said, hey, at least that guy that I don't know very well has a plan to change the direction of our state to get our economy going, and that's how I won. That's what 24 is going to be the most, one of the most important issues during the primary season and the general election. That's who will win. But, Senator, given what you and your party know about 2020 and Trump lo losing that race, 2022, and it wasn't the red wave uh, many in the Republican Party have, have it, it was expecting, does your party now want to see potentially a more centrist candidate so there is this potential to win in 2024? I think what Republican voters want is they want somebody that's going to solve their problems. So I think they're, they're, going, to, they're going to want to hear what is your plan to get inflation down? What's your plan to preserve my retirement? What's your plan to make sure we secure their border? And I think that's the people, whoever's got that I, those ideas and can sell them the best, that's how we're, that is, there's no real sort of party that picks. Uh, because if there was a party that picked, they wouldn't have picked me in, in 2010 when I ran because I was not the establishment candidate. So I think it's, what's great is we have, we have we're going to have an election and it's going to be the person with the best ideas that people believe is really going to do it. Because that's one problem. You know, we have up here, people go campaign on, on things and then they, you know, they cave in and do something else. And I think the American public is fed up with this. There's a lot of concern that a crowded field uh, will ensure the re-election, if I can call it that, uh, of Donald Trump, Senator. I know that you're not uh, going to be endorsing in this primary cycle. You've made that clear. But I wonder if it's going to be a Republican like yourself who has to go to some of the, the candidates who might uh, be crowding the stage here to get them out of this race and allow the party to coalesce around someone they see able to beat Joe Biden? I don't think, I don't think, uh, first of all, I'll never tell somebody they should get out of a race. Um, I was told not to get in the race and then get out of the race when I ran uh, because I was not the establishment candidate in 2010. I think if you want to be president, you should go for it. You should, you should go get out there and sell your ideas, see if you can raise the money to get your help, get your message out. And if you can't, it's, good, it's going to get, get winnowed down anyway because people are going to wanna run out of money or run out of votes. Uh, so this is, this is, you know, look, Donald Trump is in the position he's in because he's a former president and he has a record to run on. Um, and, and he's got a great contrast to Joe Biden. That doesn't guarantee him a win, uh, but our border was secure when he left. Our economy was better. So if you're going to run against Donald Trump to be the Republican nominee, you're going to have to say, I can do what he, what he did in his four years. I can do it better. That's, what, that's how you win. That's how I, won, how I won my races. I've said, that you have a choice. That guy, this is what you're going to get with that guy. This is what you're going to get with me. And the voters ultimately make a decision. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Florida Senator Rick Scott, of course, your state will be on full display. Two of those and potentially the mayor of Miami also getting in. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening. Coming up, we'll dive into the upcoming Treasury deluge on the heels of the debt ceiling showdown. Kaylee Lyons will walk us through the details from New York and Washington. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. Secretary Yellen drew down the TGA, that's basically the Treasury Savings Account, from $700 billion to practically nothing last week. That also ended up in non-issuance of government debt, so that was a big boost to liquidity. All that is set to change 
now. Um, actually, the TJ is going to go the other way. Billionaire Stan Druckenmiller speaking at Bloomberg Invest earlier today. This, of course, is the Treasury Department says it plans to boost its cash pile substantially by the end of this month. Kaylee Lyons, of course, is here with more on this. Kaylee, what should we be expecting? Well, we should be expecting a lot of issuance, Anne-Marie. I mean, billions, hundreds of billions of dollars worth. Remember, the Treasury's cash pile fell below $23 billion at one point last week before the debt ceiling was raised. That matched the lowest level since 2015. And now that the debt ceiling has been lifted, it is time for them to borrow big time to restore that coffer. The Treasury saying in a statement today that it plans to increase issuance of Treasury bills so it can keep financing the government and gradually rebuild the cash balance to a level more consistent uh, with what they usually do, and they expect that it will get to approximately $425 billion at the end of June. I would remind you that as of June 6th, it was at $71 billion. So we have hundreds of billions of dollars to go. And what that means is we are going to see a lot of issuance, potentially uh, issuance that we haven't really seen outside of crisis uh, era times, like what we saw during the pandemic in 2020 or back in uh, 2008. We've already seen them boost the size of auctions in recent days, like the shortest tenor benchmark bills uh, from yesterday. They are planning to issue a lot more uh, in short tenor securities and cash management bills as part of this issue and drive. But it's really going to drain liquidity out of the system. Strategists at J.P. Morgan expect the liquidity drain to be about $1 trillion. They think that will knock about 5% off the combined performance of stocks and bonds this year. City did the math, thinks a liquidity drawdown of this magnitude could could mean the S&P drops 5.4 percent over two months. And because bank deposits are going to have to soak up all that supply and yields are going to go higher, it could drive uh, money out of bank accounts and into higher yielding products like money market funds. And of course, this is just the near term consequence. We have to consider the long term issue with debt supply as well. And that was something that Ray Dalio, the billionaire founder of Bridgewater Associates, was speaking about at Bloomberg Invest earlier today. We are at the beginning of a very classic late cycle, late big cycle debt crisis when the supply demand gap, when you're producing too much debt and you have also a shortage of buyers. If we continue down this path in terms of what, what's likely over the next you know, five and ten years, then you, what, you reach the point that that balancing act becomes very difficult. So, Joe, this is really a story of maybe solving something in the near term, but not yeah. necessarily solving a long term problem. Reminding us again here, as the dust settles on this whole debt ceiling agreement, the country really didn't get a lot for it other than a lot of drama. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily change the longer term fiscal trajectory. That's for sure. Bloomberg's Kaylee Lines. Many thanks, Kaylee, for joining us. Coming up, a showdown on the floor of the House of Representatives. It's still happening. We'll be joined by Democratic Congresswoman from Washington, Susan Del Bene, next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. Conservative Republicans striking back over the debt limit agreement by halting business on the House floor once again. Joining us for more is Representative Susan Del Bene from Washington and Democratic Congress Congressional Campaign Committee Chair. Congresswoman, thank you so much for your time. I mean, you're there on the floor today. Just give us a sense when you think we could see regular order again on the House of Representatives. Well, um, it's a great question, and I don't know, because I don't think Republicans know. Um, we came in uh, for votes yesterday. They were unable to pass a procedural bill that um, the majority passes. The first time this had happened since 2002, and um, the chaos continues. Uh, there is no sense of direction. We just found out that votes are officially canceled for the day. Um, unclear what's supposed to happen tomorrow. So. Um, the, the Republican huh. caucus is in chaos. Well, so tell us what can happen here next, Congresswoman. You don't only uh, chair the DCCC, but you're the former chair uh, of the new Democratic coalition. What can the center do, as we saw in the outcome of this debt ceiling debate, to wrest control from a few people who seem to be stopping business? 
Well, I mean, if we really want to pass important legislation, we need leaders who are willing to come together, um, realize that to pass legislation, we need to get it through the House, the Senate, and to the President's desk. And that means building bipartisan uh, legislation and a bipartisan coalition. Um, Republicans have not been interested in that. They've been passing very, very partisan bills. And as such, um, they are controlled by the most extremes in their party. So we've kind of lost the moderates on the Republican side. There aren't folks standing up to move legislation and work in a collaborative way. Um, they just keep putting partisan bills on the floor, and they can't even pass those now. Barring potentially the debt ceiling bill, which saw, I think, moderates really on both sides of the aisle pass for that. But, Congresswoman, Speaker McCarthy, if there was to be a vote of, co of confidence on his speakership, there is potentially a growing list of Democrats who would vote for him, cross party lines, because they want to get back to the regular order and they also want to show that potentially we can work in a bipartisan way and definitely don't want someone from the far right flank to get that gavel. Would you be one of those Democratic representatives willing to do that? You know, we have strong Democratic leaders. I, we all voted for Hakeem Jeffries to be speaker, and he would do an incredible job uh, leading us going forward, actually caring about governing. Um, Republicans have created the mess that they're in. Uh, the folks have not stood up to make sure that they build these bipartisan coalitions. So right now, this is the challenge that they face. Um, we're here to govern, and we have leaders who are here to govern, leaders who are here to work on serious legislation. Um, Republicans have to stand up to do that, and we've yet to see that so far. A lot of this, of course, is about funding, uh, potential extra funding for the war effort in Ukraine. Uh, Speaker McCarthy has made clear that uh, he doesn't want to go there if it's a bill that's generated from the Senate. Will we see... Uh, something maybe from your office, Congresswoman, someone in the House start writing legislation on this? Well, I think we've been very clear that we stand with the people of Ukraine. The president has been clear and has helped build a strong coalition with NATO to support Ukraine and stand up for the Ukrainian people and for democracy. Uh, Republicans have been unclear where they stand. Uh, Speaker McCarthy says that he doesn't want to look at uh, additional support for Ukraine. Um, we've seen Republicans in the Senate have different opinions. Again, there's no consistent view from Republicans. What we need are leaders who are going to stand up um, and stand up for the issues that we care about. In this case, uh, stand up for Ukraine, uh, stand up for democracy, and um, continue to be uh, a strong leader with our allies. Is there any growing anxiety amongst the Democratic conference that if there were, was to be a need for more aid for Ukraine, it really does need to get done before the end of the year because of the pressure, more pressure, some Republicans may face to not take that vote, given next year everything will be about the November election? Well, I think when we talk about governing, governing means having responsible leaders, working with folks on legislation, building that strong coalition. And that strong coalition means engaging with people before bills are written, making sure that we have strong support, um, running them through committees. Republicans talk a lot about regular order, but they have not been interested in regular order at all. They've been jamming bills through, and now they can't even pass their own bills. So I do think that if we want to solve issues that we face, if we want to put good long-term legislation in place to help our communities, to help families, to help um, our country, it means responsible leaders working together to get it done. And unfortunately, Republicans have not been partners in that, especially uh, House Republicans. Congresswoman, you re reintroduced your bill standardizing the child tax credit uh, today. I'm assuming that the Republican leadership does not plan to entertain that on the floor. You can tell me if I'm wrong. And I guess I'm just getting to the broader question. Now that the debt ceiling uh, saga is behind us and we are seeing this discord in the Republican majority in the House, are you done? Is the factory closed here for the rest of the session? Well, we're going to keep working hard to pass legislation that makes a difference for families throughout our country. Um, the child tax credit is a great example. We saw those monthly checks go out during the pandemic, um, and they made a huge difference for families. We helped lift almost um, half of children living in poverty out of poverty across this country. We have tons of data showing how effective this program is. 
we need to reinstate that and um, we need to make it permanent. That's something that I've been fighting hard for because when we talk about policies that make a difference, not only save us money, because there's a huge expense to kids living in poverty, not having opportunity. Um, that's over a trillion dollars a year, um, That the impact of that. We can do a lot by investing in our kids, um, giving them great opportunity, uh, lift them up. That not only saves us money, but it be, provides great opportunity going forward. So it's the right thing to do, something we're going to continue to work hard on to get it through, and it should be bipartisan. Congresswoman, thank you. Representative Susan Del Benny of Washington, chair of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. I hope you'll come back and talk to us about life on the campaign trail. Coming up, our political panel will join us to discuss the latest hopefuls jump into the race for the Republican presidential nomination, including former Vice President Mike Pence. It's on. This is Balance and Power on Bloomberg TV. Now, keeping up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. I'm John Hyland. New York Mayor Eric Adams told residents they should stay inside or wear masks outdoors to battle the smoke from the Canadian wildfires blanketing the largest U.S. city. The Federal Aviation Administration is also grounding inbound flights to LaGuardia Airport due to low visibility. Wildfires are poised to burn more land than ever in Canada, with more than 9.4 million acres scorched so far, according to the Canadian National Fire Database. That's about double the size of New Jersey. U.S. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas received a 90-day extension for his 2002 financial disclosure report. The upcoming release could offer fresh insight into Thomas's finance since an investigation revealed he and his wife traveled on billionaire GOP megadonor Harlan Crow's yacht and private jet. Crow also bought Thomas's childhood home in Georgia from the justice and his relatives and paid for private schooling for his grandnephew. Lionel Messi will join Major League Soccer Club Inter Miami. That's according to the BBC, who says Messi is turning down a deal from Saudi Arabia that would have paid him $400 million annually. The Argentine superstar is being offered a profit-sharing agreement with Adidas and Apple. The Athletic reported citing people familiar with the transaction. And the PGA would lose its tax-exempt status under a new bill introduced today. Representative John Garamendi introduced legislation that could close the tax loophole that allows the PGA Tour and other professional sports leagues to claim tax-exempt status. The legislation comes as a response to the PGA's merger with Live Golf, which is backed by the Saudi Arabia Public Investment Fund. Global News, 24 hours a day on Darren and on Bloomberg Originals. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm John Hyland, and this is Bloomberg. Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. The field vying for the Republican presidential nomination, growing by the day. We've got a couple more to show for it now. Joining us to discuss, Kevin Sheridan, former senior advisor to the Romney-Ryan campaign and founder of Protean Public Affairs. Joined by Kristen Hahn, Democratic strategist and partner at Rock Solutions. Uh, welcome to both of you. Anne-Marie Hordern is, of course, in New York. Kevin, we're seeing a real contrast here uh, in the types of approaches that different candidates are taking, really at, at toppling Donald Trump as mm -hmm. he has a commanding lead over the field. I want to just walk you through a couple of the ads here that we got over the past 24 hours, beginning with the former Vice President Mike Pence's campaign announcement. Listen. I have long believed to whom much is given, much will be required. My family and I have been blessed beyond measure with opportunities to serve this nation, and it'd be easy to stay on the sidelines. But that's not how I was raised. That's why today, before God and my family, I'm announcing I'm running for president of the United States. All right, so we feel good about ourselves. The strings coming up, City on a Hill even uses those words. <laughs> A lot like uh, North Dakota's governor, Doug Burgum's presidential announcement ad, this looked like a trailer for Dances with Wolves. Listen and watch. <laughs> I grew up in a tiny town in North Dakota. Woke was what you did at 5 a.m. to start the day. Anger, yelling, infighting. That's not going to cut it anymore. Let's get things done. 
there were some great nature shots. Well, you'll have to see them for yourself. As opposed to what we heard from the former governor of New Jersey last night, Chris Christie, who held a town hall and really went after Trump, accusing him of, you know, adding to the deficit, making the border worse, accusing him of grifting. It is daughter and her husband Jared stole two billion dollars or was they were gifted this from uh, the Saudis. Which of these approaches will resonate? We don't know that either of the person, those approaches will resonate but they're going to try uh, a couple of different lanes. The Christie lane is to go right through Trump to attack him directly to say his name every time he can uh, get on a stage to try to get enough signatures and, or enough uh, uh, individual donors and uh, up to 1% so they can get into a debate where you yeah. can actually attack him face to face. And that's, I think, what every, the TV that everybody's looking forward to, if he can actually do that. He knows him very well. He was his debate partner, obviously, and, and they have a 20-year history together. So if he can do that, if he can get on a stage with him, that's his lane. The other two, I think, are throwing back to, I, in the case of Pence, as you mentioned, he is definitely running on a Reagan yeah. model. He's, it's a throwback to the to the Reagan, look, the Reagan model is very popular in the Republican Party still, sure, of course. but it, it, you know, it's come under some derision from new types of um, Republicans who uh, want to say that's the old way. We're doing the the new Ron DeSantis, Donald Trump way, and and so we'll, they'll have to fight it out, and we'll see. And Bergam is a total um, newcomer, so yeah. <laughs> we don't know. He's got enough money to make his name sure known in Iowa. Yeah, he certainly does. But before Chris Christie, of course, was a Trump. Uh, acolyte and, and worked even uh, for the former president. If you have long memories, he also dealt with in New Jersey Bridgegate. And I wonder if that scandal could potentially still haunt him as he wants to take the debate stage once again for president. Take a listen because he addressed it last night. The biggest mistake I made in public life was that I put a few people into a position of authority at the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey who went on a frolicking detour to divert traffic off the George Washington Bridge. Without telling me, without me knowing anything about it, they used my power and my authority to play a fraternity prank. And it cost me a lot. All right, Kristen, so he's kind of passing the buck. Wasn't my fault, I just gave power to the wrong people. Do you think Bridgegate will come up for him and potentially hurt him? as he tries to either go for the actual presidency ship and, and get the nominee, at least, or even as he goes and attacks the former president, and if that's his mission. I mean, I think it'll definitely come up. The, the other candidates uh, in the Republican field for the presidency will make sure that it comes up. It already tanked one of his candidacies. So, you know, this is something that goes to, you know, his character, who he is. I also think that, you know, it's interesting that all of a sudden that he wants to now run straight through, um, you know, Donald Trump. It's been, um, it's been a long time coming. I guess I'm glad that the candidates are doing it now. But these are all things that are going to come up. I mean, you know, if, if now his, um, you know, he's flip-flopping, if his approach now is that he's going to come after Trump, there are a lot of visuals when he, you know, when he decided that he was going to endorse him when he took meetings with him. Mm -hmm. Went along with a lot of what the former president did. So, um, yeah, these are all things that he's going to have to contend with. Is it uh, attractive, though? Because people still get, for, certainly those who commute in New York, get angry about this still when you mention Bridgegate. Is it attractive still, despite all the changes in politics, to apologize? Well, I don't think Republican, his biggest problem with Republicans is going to be Bridgegate. And I think he's done over the years a pretty good job of answering all the questions. Remember the press conference back in New Jersey uh, at the time where he took every question until reporters literally had no more questions. <laughs> right. uh, when do you see that from a politician? Mm -hmm. uh, he's got other problems. He's, uh, he's, he's underwater with Republicans by a lot, and he needs to dig his way out of that. And while he's attacking the front runner, uh, you know, we've got to make sure that there's enough other voters, the two-thirds of other voters out there that uh, might want to move beyond Trump, yeah. that he can, he can pick up some, uh, some momentum with them. Mm -hmm. What also we're going to see, of course, as we gear up for 2024, are more of these CNN-like town halls. We had Nikki Haley most recently, former President Donald Trump, and then upcoming Chris Christie has agreed to one, as well as Mike Pence. Here is a little bit of how the CNN town hall with Donald Trump, though, played out. Take a listen, because this looks like it was one of the reasons why it cost someone their job today. Please welcome the front runner for the Republican nomination, former President Donald Trump. Thank you. Thank you. 
You know, Kevin, CNN being at the uh, at crossroads right now and trying to figure out the direction it wants to go, how damaging is that in general to politics, given the fact that they are a network that always has these town halls and it is a sp space where not just journalists, but also whether Republican or Democrat voters can go in and ask of officials, want to be elected officials, questions? Yeah, and they have another one tonight, so I don't know that they'll be um, turning away from that model completely. It sounds more like Chris Lick just um, didn't get the vision uh, executed on uh, and don't bring a reporter to the gym with you uh, would be the two <laughs> lessons there. But, um, you know, it remains to be seen. Uh, David Zasloff, the head of CNN, says that, uh, or Time Warner says that he's going to, you know, do a really long search for the next... Uh, uh, head of CNN and what direction he's going to go in, we don't know. They said they want to go back to the boring old CNN, the, you know, the new news gathering and, and straight CNN. So I, I could see them, you know, today they took um, um, Governor Burgum's entire um, uh, campaign announcement. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they may be one of the few networks that's going to do something like that. So uh, they, they are an important player in, in even in Republican politics if they want to be. Other than not allowing uh, reporters in uh, the gym with you, <laughs> Kristen is very good. I agree with um, Kevin on that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there, are, there are lessons to be learned here for media in 2023, almost 24 now, covering a presidential campaign. Mm -hmm. Does the departure here of Chris Licht, by the way, the CEO of CNN, if you're not following this, uh, gone after one year, tell us anything about the way the rules are changing here in this new campaign cycle? I mean, I think that the rules may be changing a little bit, but it's how you it's how you address these things and how you approach. Like, for example, Donald Trump's. I didn't actually necessarily, as much as I, I do not like the former president, I do not think he's quit to be the president again. Um, you know, there were going to be some challenges there with that town hall and stacking that town hall with voters who were clearly right. all huge Trump supporters is not a good way to, to approach, you know, about, you know, to, to give the viewers a balanced view of what's going on. It's like they knew what was going to happen. They, they played to the ratings because nobody else was doing it. Kristen and Kevin, thank you so much. And you're going to sticking around with us. Coming up, there's no shortage of reaction on Capitol Hill today to the news of PGA merging with Saudi-backed Live Golf. We'll get the Take More political panel next. This is Balance of Power. Let's be honest, the Saudis aren't buying the PGA because they love golf. They're buying the PGA because they want to erase their dizzying campaign of political repression. I don't know what the antitrust ramifications would be, so I'd, I'd want to look at that. Yeah, I don't have concerns otherwise. I have this uh, arm's length attitude toward Saudi Arabia. Uh, when it comes to foreign relations as well as golf. I think the commission has been so discredited that he can hardly present a credible voice for PGA. Some of the reaction on Capitol Hill after Saudi-backed Live Golf agreed to merge with the PGA. Back with us now is our panel, Kevin Sheridan, former senior advisor to the Romney-Ryan campaign and founder of Protean Public Affairs, and Kristen Hahn, Democratic strategist and Rock Solutions partner. All right, uh, Kevin, first to you. Do you think we will see investigations in Congress? And if we do, do they even amount to something when it comes to this deal? Yeah, I think the bigger question is probably if DOJ gets, um, gets involved and, and doesn't want to do this on uh, antitrust uh, competition reasons. They, I could see them blocking it. I don't know that Congress, maybe they can hold hearings, uh, how much they can actually do to stop it, though. Uh, there's probably a little bit of bipartisan consensus around it, but uh, it's mostly... I think um, Democrats who are very anti-Saudi uh, right now that, that want answers on, on this. It's a good it's a good day for golf fans, but uh, and a good day for Phil Mickelson who got his huge payoff and, and then gets to go back to uh, to the tour. But um, you know, it really remains to be seen what Congress does and what uh, what the Saudis do next. Do they take on tennis or, or something else? Actually, there's <laughs> a great question about that. Uh, but is is it actually worth Democrats' time to pursue this as an antitrust case? 
I mean, I think that Kevin's right. There could be some, you know, hearings in the Judiciary Committees in the mm -hmm. House and Senate, but, you know, I guess in the Senate, not the House. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not a bad message. I think the Saudis were very clearly sports washing. Yeah. Um, that's, yeah. that's their intent. The PGA seems to be going along with it, but what do you do? You see know, if they go to tennis business. next, because it seems like they're not yes. done here. They we're looking at F1. We'll see what comes next. Right. right. Many thanks to our political panel, Kevin Sheridan. Great to have you at the table, Kevin. Come back and see us. And Kristen Hahn, many thanks as well. Check out the Washington Edition newsletter on the terminal and online. And thanks for joining us on Balance of Power. That does it for me in New York, Joe, of course, in Washington. And we'll see you right here tomorrow. This is Bloomberg.